So first off, I'd like to uh, just uh, make sure everybody knows that Dr. Morrison was uh, helping us with designing this uh, project and this analysis, so he will, I'd like to thank him for all these uh, ideas. And uh, I'd like to thank as well uh, Dr. Anna Alba, who was part of uh, Dr. Andres Perez's team last year as well. She's now back in Spain, but she was also fundamental uh, helping us with this analysis. So, uh, PERS control project is uh, probably not news for anyone in this room. These projects are still very popular at the regional level, sometimes at the state level, provi province level, if you're in Canada, and as well as national uh, level. And uh, I was personally involved with this particular project, which I'm sure you all have seen these images before. And these projects are extremely helpful, even though we know most of them are based on a volunteer uh, participation, they are very helpful in giving an insights on diseases like PERS. So uh, one of the early lessons we learned, for example, from the MSHMP was that PERS uh, seems to have the seasonal pattern and start off in the middle of October, goes until February, and we can see this very predictable pattern over there. And Dr. Tussinon was one of the pioneers in this work where he was describing temporal and spatial patterns. And uh, in one of his early publications uh, using data from this project, uh, he, con he concludes that the weekly incidence uh, was low during the spring and the summer uh, of PERS and then high during the, the fall and the winter. And so this is the conclusion that it seems like we do have this predictable uh, increase in the incidence of PERS during the winter, and that's why now we are hearing watch out, PERS season is coming. Um, however, we have to keep in mind that this was in the early stages of the project. It was back 2009 to 2013, and it was at an aggregate level. And very nicely, the authors of those, that paper, they state here that uh, that's what we're seeing, but we are aware that there, that are other high swine density areas in the United States, such as Oklahoma or North Carolina, that might be underrepresented, so therefore take these conclusions with caution. And nowadays we do have way more data, so we are able to maybe take a look again at seasonality of birds. On top of that, uh, last year when I was involved with this project, we started looking at huge differences that we can see when we break down this uh, data uh, at the system level. So we see that the patterns started becoming less obvious. So we started thinking, oh, what's going on? Are these breaks really that predictable? And then uh, and this slide was a contribution from Dr. Villata where he was, we were plotting the summer breaks especially because we started just having a feeling that there was a lot of that going on. So he plotted it back from 2009 and we saw that actually there was quite a substantial number of uh, summer breaks happening uh, across the United States. At the same time, I wanted to try uh, this new method uh, called the time-dependent reproductive number, which is uh, really well known and used for modeling. And basically, it's a way to calculate the number of new infections that one case could potentially uh, cause. And so it's used a lot in modeling, and, and it can tell us about the transmissibility, uh, transmissibility of pathogens in different populations. Uh, and you can use that for several things. You can, uh, for example, recognize super spread events. You can also test efficacy. So we could look at, let's say we start a vaccination and we can see how it's working. So I really wanted to do that. And so we divided the states in different regions and, and focusing on swine producing regions and the data we had. This is all using data from uh, MSHMP as well. And as you can see in this graph, right away we could see, uh, just looking at it, that we have different patterns of incidence. So for example here, each of these colors represent each of those regions. And in yellow here you can see this predictable pattern that Dr. Tusina described in his paper, which is pretty easy to recognize just with the naked eye. However, when we looked at the other ones, then it became a little bit more complicated because we start having a lot of noise. But nonetheless, we looked at this work and we said, well, there seems to be a pretty obvious difference in PERS incidence according to region. And this uh, is the calculation of this number I was talking to you about, uh, called TDR. And usually uh, we describe TDR, uh, we can measure how endemic the disease is. So we know PERS is endemic, so TDR tends to be around 1. 
If TDR is more than one, that means the disease is spreading. If it's less than one, it's dying out. So we can see here by region that this is the region Minnesota, Iowa, and we see that this value TDR is pretty stable. However, if we go to other regions, for example, this is more North Carolina region, we see some peaks that then talking to the veterinarians in the field, it seems to make sense that the, apparently every three years or so, they seem to have a, a bigger of a challenge in terms of birds. Is it a new strain coming in or, or something that remains to be understood? So all of this uh, led us to think that we should uh, learn more about the seasonality and, th and see whether we could differentiate that by geographical region. So the main objective of this study was to analyze the temporal patterns of PERS uh, at the farm level for five major swine producing states across the United States. In other words, we wanted to ask the questions, are yearly patterns conserved uh, across different U.S. states? So uh, our data source was the MSHMP, and we used uh, the whole period of, uh, since the project started in 2009, so we had uh, seven, eight years worth of data. We had weekly data, and we also had a pretty well standardized definition for a fur new break. Um, we had enough data to look at five different states across the U.S., so we looked at Minnesota, Iowa, North Carolina, Nebraska, and Illinois. And we used a model called Autoregressive Integrated Moving Average, or ARIMA model. You might have heard about it. I'm not going to spend too much time because I'm pretty sure besides me, nobody really wants a modeling lesson, lesson at this time of the day. But uh, what you, I want you to understand is that we were looking for a trend, so just a general trend, increasing, decreasing, what does it look like? And then we were testing, basically building a model and testing for different seasonalities. So we were asking the model, uh, do we see uh, something that is conducive for us to think that we have something every six months, every four months, or every three months, or yearly? And then for some regions, we had a pretty low counts of outbreaks, which is good, I suppose. Uh, but then we also adjust for that with a different type of model. So I'll give you an example so this becomes a little bit more clear. I'm going to use the example of Iowa. So we look at this, and yes, uh, apparently, again, looking just from our eyes, it seems like we have this pattern. But we can then decompose this time series and look at the data separately. So the first uh, part here shows just the observed. And then we see that trend is a linear increasing trend. And then now if you look back to this one, we really see that overall this seems to, to be increasing. So that's what this, what this step does. It allows us to see this more clearly. It also easily recognizes this uh, yearly pattern. But then we have a whole bunch of other stuff which I'm going to call noise or random movement. So this is what we're testing to see whether there is more, more to the data that we can't just see with our eyes. And then, this is a step that I'm going to skip a lot of things, but we're testing a lot of different parameters just to look at the dependence. Do we have to go back one period to explain this period, or two, or maybe we have to go three? So this is how we play with the parameters until we come to a model, a final model that we think looks good. So this one, you can hardly see there is a black line, which is the observed, and then the blue line is the model. So you can see it fits pretty well here. You can hardly differentiate between the two. And then we look at a bunch of other things like residuals and make sure everything is good. So uh, for the results, uh, we just used systems that we had complete data for for each of those regions. Uh, so that's a total of over seven years of data that we had. 300 farms uh, divided across these regions uh, here in the U.S. that I told you about those five different states. And then what we saw in the results was that we did see a remarkable difference in personality among those states. So for most of the states we looked at, there was a yearly peak. However, we saw one state that had a peak every six months, and we saw one state that had no seasonality. And here it is. So we saw that, uh, interestingly, Minnesota, Nebraska, and North Carolina had one annual peak, and even more interesting for me was to see that Minnesota and North Carolina fit exactly the same model, which means there is something about those two regions that is very, very similar, even though they are geographically quite far. We saw that in Iowa, what well, we suspected the summer breaks were a thing, 
So they, there, is, there are actually two breaks in the year uh, in the Iowa region. And for Illinois, we really didn't see any seasonality. So it seems like PERS occur, I don't want to say randomly, but we cannot really predict uh, how, how far apart those peaks in PERS are happening. Uh, so this brings a lot of discussion, and I've had uh, some of those with people that know more about, about ge geography of the United States than me. Uh, but there are a lot of uh, landscape and environmental factors that could be helping uh, with these differences uh, from region to region. We have the difference in the systems themselves as well and how pigs are moving in and out of those states. Uh, we also cannot rule out how people are identifying these outbreaks because the way the system is set up, we rely a lot on the veterinarian's judgment. And we know some areas may have more farms that are vaccinated than others. So this is something to keep in mind and I've already mentioned the movement of animals. So the summer breaks uh, appeared to be evident in Iowa. So uh, some things that I think might explain what we saw was all the commingling opportunities that we see during the summer. So maybe there is an increase on just the opportunities of uh, bringing something back to the farm or just um, more movement overall. Uh, we also maybe think that because we tend to think PERS is a, is a winter season, there might be some relaxation in regards to biosecurity. And, uh, and then another thing is just the amount of activities that we have going on. It's, it's so huge in the swine industry and everything is so dynamic. Because, so maybe what's happening is just we're having enough activities, exchange and things happening with service providers that we have enough opportunities now to just keep this virus spreading more and more. Some limitations as an epidemiologist, I always have to think about those and make sure I, I tell them, uh, I tell you guys what they are. Uh, we are talking only about sow herds, so perhaps if we include the growing pig population, that, that may change our results here. We also unfortunately were unable to assess all the states that I would like to, uh, that are important in terms of pig production, so this is the ones that we had enough data for. Uh, we also have a limited uh, number of production companies uh, because this is a volunteer project. And we always have to consider that we might have missed uh, an outbreak or declared a new outbreak, even though it might have been a resident virus. So again, this veterinary judgment is, is in this classification as well. How we could potentially apply this? Uh, we could make predictions by region and see if these results hold true for the future. Uh, and we can also try and gather more data and see how this, uh, this happens in other states. So this was uh, about the seasonality study. I also, I also wanted to show you some fresh results of a follow-up. Uh, I don't know, may, some of you may, may have seen this work that we did uh, last year as well with uh, PERS and land coverage. And in that study we saw that uh, farms that were located in areas that had a higher slope uh, or that had uh, shrubs and trees around the farm were protected of having PERS outbreaks. So uh, after we published that, I started getting a lot of questions such as, oh, but how, how many trees, uh, what kind of trees are you talking about? Or uh, does the orientation matter? Does the wind direction matter? Does the neighboring farm matter? And I said, I don't know, I have no idea, let's do another study. So we started this uh, case control uh, study design last year Again, using the same database of the SHMP, but now aiming to do a more detailed assessment of each farm. So we selected cases and controls. Uh, cases were uh, farms that had a PERS outbreak during their participation at the SHMP. And the controls were matched, so they were farms from the same system that did not have an outbreak in that same week. Uh, we selected them at random, and uh, we had a total of 208, so 104 cases and 104 controls. Uh, some of the variables we were interested on, well, those are the variables that producers and vets were interested on and were coming to me and asking me about. So they, will, they included barn orientation, distance to main road and whether that, that road was a highway, as well as presence of farms, regardless of whether they were swine farms or not, within one and three kilometers. Uh, we also wanted to look more in a more detailed way on tree coverage and weather data. So Emily Geary, the coordinator of the MSHMP, was the one doing all the tree assessments. She's very familiar with that kind of thing. 
And so what she was doing basically for all of those farms we selected, she was uh, going on Google Earth and mapping that farm and then getting all these uh, estimates for us. So she looked at, for example, I have here a, a barn that we randomly selected and it was oriented east to west. And then she categorized the amount of tree in terms of uh, density so she could actually measure and get an average value from Google Earth itself. She also looked at completeness in terms of was it a, a pretty good uh, roll of trees or was there a lot of gaps? So we scored that from zero to four, to, from one to four. And also she estimated the percentage. So just so you have an example here, we have, for example, she did that for all the regions, for all the orientations. So for the south here, for example, we see that we have a pretty consistent layer of trees. So the completeness would be four, that's the maximum, and it's 100%. On the other side here, on the west region, we see there, is, there are no trees, so that would be a zero. So this is an extreme, but this is kind of what she had to work on. She also looked at the main road, so she just calculated how far the farm was from a main road and whether that uh, road was a highway or not. And then looked at uh, presence of farms be, uh, between one kilometer and the farm of interest and, and other farms, one and three kilometers and whether there was trees between them. So as you can imagine, this, this took a lot of time. It was, it was very time demanding. Uh, summer of this year, uh, I, I hired a summer student and then she did all the weather data. So weather data is publicly available. And uh, so what the student did, she went, she located the farm, located the closest weather station, and she looked at the predominant wind direction in the last seven days and 14 days before the outbreak was reported. Uh, she also looked at percent calm wind and the average wind speed for those uh, 7 and 14 days before the outbreak. And here are some preliminary results. We are going to include many other things in the model, but I just wanted to give you a taste of uh, some of the things we are finding. Uh, we found that there were two risk factors uh, for PERS outbreaks or for farms to be cases. Uh, one of them was having a farm within one kilometer, and the other one was the average wind speed. So the faster the wind was in the previous days before the outbreak, particularly 14 days before the outbreak, uh, that was increasing the odds of a farm to be a case. And we also found a lot of other uh, variables we were looking at were uh, protecting uh, the, the farm to be a case. So this is because the odds ratios are less than one. So, for example, having uh, trees between farms was good, was protecting farms from being cases, as well as being naive. So, naive farms broke less, uh, which we would always expect. Uh, tree completeness, average tree percentage, and amount of trees were all, they all seemed to be protective as well. And percent calm wind. So, the more calm the wind was, that was also uh, reducing the odds of farms being positive. So those are some results. Uh, stay tuned for more. We are going to include things that we know are important, such as swine density in the area, herd size, and, and all that information. So this is not yet final. And with that, uh, we have three take-home messages here. The first one, uh, do not assume that there is a high risk for per solely in the winter. There seems that, that that's very uh, region dependent. Also, uh, on that same line, just uh, make sure that you ensure bi high biosecurity standards in your farm throughout the year. And finally, I, I'm asked this, this a lot, so if I, if I was a producer, if I was building a new barn and I had the option, I would definitely build it in a slope and leave trees around it. And again, I'd like to acknowledge all the colleagues from Minnesota that are still helping me to finish up those projects. Uh, of course, wine veterinarians that are very helpful, especially with their insights and ideas and questions. I'd like to thank Dr. Morrison for all his guidance, uh, Dr. Vilauta, Anna, and Puig from Spain, and uh, most of this was financed by Chic. and National Pork Board is funding my visit here today, so I'd like to thank them as well.